Hey guys, how are you? Recently I've been working on an internship in a different town, uh, working on plants. Somewhat close to plants is the study of fungi, um, and so since they often work hand in hand, I've been reading a lot of books about fungi to uh, brush up a little bit on my knowledge. See, I'd taken courses about fungal biology and how it works with plants, and I've also just always had some kind of fascination with them. I've read books by Paul Stamets and uh, Merlin Sheldrake, whose name I'm pretty jealous of. It sounds like uh, he could fit in right with the Telvanni. And some other works. But because I brushed up on all this stuff, it really got me thinking about why do I find fungi to be so interesting? You know, was there something that happened in my past that made me actually care about them or made me actually wonder about uh, their existence in general and, and just how unique and, and alien they can be. And when I got to that line of thought, uh, I thought about Morrowind. Because it's always been my favorite game, and as a child, running through and seeing all these giant mushroom trees and all these, these glowing swampy mushrooms and stuff, it definitely left an impression in me. And not to mention the giant Telvanni Towers. So I thought it would be pretty interesting to try and combine my biological studies with my hobby of playing Morrowind and video games in general. And so uh, I thought it'd be cool to go through Vardenfell and, and talk about the biology of the fungal bodies and uh, all sorts of things surrounding them. This video was originally larger in scope, uh, including ESO and the mushrooms and fungus in that version of Morrowind. But uh, this video is going to be focusing on Vardenfell in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind from 2002. So let's get into it. To structure this video, I've decided only to cover things related to Vardenfell, which is the main landmass on which you experience Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. We will be looking at a bit of my background as it pertains to fungi, the regions of Vardenfell which contain fungi, their etymology, alchemical properties, real-life inspirations, and finally, their implications for the surrounding wildlife and citizens. If I veer away from the roadmap a bit, please bear with me. It is a large undertaking. I am currently majoring in two areas of study. One is biology, the study of life. The other is environmental science, which has a focus on holistic understanding of all the pieces of ecosystems and how they work together. As this is the case, it stands to reason I would study fungi at some point. To give some quick vocabulary, fungi are a family of eukaryotic organisms and come in many forms. These include mushrooms, molds, and more. They also make up part of a lichen's biomass. More on that later. Mushrooms are the fruiting body of a fungus, appearing when specific environmental conditions are met that are conducive to reproduction. To give more details, fungi reproduce by spore, not by seeds like plants. Fungi are also saprotrophs, meaning they feed on decaying matter and are incredibly important for decomposition. Fungi known as mycorrhizae grow in association with plant roots, allowing them to access more nutrients in exchange for sugars. Over 90% of plants have a relationship with at least one mycorrhizal fungus species. There is enough mycorrhizae on Earth that, if stretched end to end, could reach halfway across the Milky Way galaxy, which is 280 quadrillion miles. Now that you've had a crash course on fungi, let's look at the regions of Vardenfell that support its existence. The Bitter Coast is the first region that greets new arrivals to Vardenfell. It does so with mucky swamp water that soils the boots and holds onto nutrients that lack nearby oxygen with which to decompose. Rain is common, and the warmth of the region bodes well for fungi. Hence, this is home to the most diverse selections of fungi in Vardenfell. One of the first fungi a traveler can spot is the bungler's bane. This fungus is what is known as a shelf fungus, growing off of trees and stumps in the area. 
forming a shelf of sorts. It is mottled brown and orange. To me, it looks like it could be based on any of the following. The Dryad Saddle, Polyporus squamosa, which is edible and prefers deciduous wood. This mushroom apparently tastes like a watermelon rind. Wonder who figured that one out. Ling Chi, Ganoderma lucidum, a mushroom thought by the Chinese to produce immortality or spiritual potency. Candies are made from it and sold in Chinese markets such as those in New York City. And finally, the Hemlock Varnish Shelf, Ganoderma suye, a soft and cork-like cap. Although edible at early stages, this shelf fungus quickly becomes bitter. Judging by its colloquial title of Bungler's Bane and poor alchemical effects, which we will discuss later on, I would feel comfortable attributing the Hemlock Varnish Shelf as its IRL counterpart. A very physically similar fungus, the Hyphophasia, also frequents similar habitats and is a shelf fungus. This shelf is light brown and also grows on trees. It has very little benefit over the Bungler's Bane alchemically, and looks to be a similar species to those previously mentioned. Its name, Hyphophasia, puts together two concepts. Hypha refers to hyphae, the branching filaments that form the mycelium or overall structure of a fungus. Similarly, fascia refers to sheets or bands of connective tissue. This is a very redundant name, but it sounds pretty cool compared to Bungler's Bane. Besides this pair exists another within the Bitter Coast region. The Luminous Russula is a blue mushroom found in small clusters near trees. It gives off a low blue glow, hence the luminous title. As far as Russula goes, this is just a genus of about 750 different ectomycorrhizal fungi. There are a handful of bioluminescent fungi that exist in real life, but those typically only glow in the mycelia and not the cap. As such, I see the Luminous Russula as a mixture of the following. 1. The Jack-o'-lantern, Omphalotus olearius. This is a poisonous mushroom whose cap can glow thanks to bioluminescent bacteria. 2. The Quilted Green Russula, Russula virescens. This is a mild and nutty tasting mushroom with a dull green color. And 3. The Lilac Bonnet, Mycena pura. Small and purple, it contains a small amount of poison, which could explain the alchemical effect. Violet Copernus is a fungus quite similar to the Luminous Russula, albeit not emitting a colorful aura. The Copernus part of the name comes from the ancient Greek word kopernos, meaning full of dung or filth. Basically, this means that the violet copernus often thrives on the waste of Vardenfell's common fauna. In this area, I would assume this to be that of the mud crabs, nix hounds, or quama. Interestingly, many mushrooms containing the hallucinogenic chemical psilocybin also grow in waste products of animals. The hallucinogenic compounds are an evolved form of poison meant to dissuade predators from consuming the mushrooms. Since the violet copernus also contains poison, I think it's fair to say that this fungus may also be hallucinogenic. Who needs moon sugar anyway? As far as possible inspirations for the violet copernus go, I'm going to assume it is quite similar to the luminous russula, but with the addition of psilocybe merdaria, a hallucinogenic growing in manure. The Ascadian Isles are the next region of focus. These fields and water bodies provide ample grounds in which the citizens of the area can plant crops such as salt rice and cork bulb. Because of the warm, fertile climate, giant mushroom trees called emperor parasols grow to amazing heights. One could imagine the incredibly vast mats of mycelium grown beneath their feet as they walk through the shade of the parasols. These take clear inspiration from common parasol mushrooms such as the Macrolepiota procera, named for its parasol-shaped cap. They must also contain extremely thick layers of chitin to maintain their structure. I always thought these giant mushroom trees were straight out of fantasy, but I was wrong. It turns out that before we had towering trees, there existed tall, capless fungal stalks called prototaxites. These rose around 20 feet in the air and existed between 420 and 350 million years ago. Although mushrooms take center stage, plants still have important roles to fill, 
even in Vardenfell's ashy wastelands. For the final branch of the regional discussion, I will combine the Ashlands, Molagamir, and Azura's Coast in one. All of these regions are rocky and dry, playing host to only the hardiest plants and organisms. So how could a fungus thrive here? Well, they couldn't, at least not without help. Within these regions exist the black, green, and red lichen varieties. Lichen is not necessarily a type of fungus, but rather a phenomena of symbiosis between a fungus and an alga. When plants first evolved to exist on land, it is thought that lichen was the primary vehicle. Mostly fungus, a lichen works between its constituent parts to maintain its footing and produce compounds beneficial to its partners. The fungus can help break down materials locked within solid mineral, such as rocks, while also rooting the symbiote. The algae can photosynthesize, providing something of value to the fungus, which allows it to survive without any real root structure. Pretty amazing. Since these variations are fairly nondescript, I think this explanation serves well enough to describe them. One of the most notorious features of Morrowind is its broken alchemy system. If you have the, uh, intelligence, you can craft very powerful concoctions. Of course, you must also have the right ingredients to do so. Going in order of discussion, we will start with the Bungler's Bane. This shell fungus can be used to create potions of Dispel, or poisons of Drain Speed, Drain Endurance, and Drain Strength. Because of its warning name and awful effects, my assumption on it being a hemlock varnish shelf seems to be appropriate. Hyphophasia produces the following effects when matched with a similar reagent. Drain luck, drain agility, drain fatigue, and detect enchantment. These all work as the names would suggest, with the last being a useful tool when looting rich homes and such. The Luminous Russula is a dangerous ingredient which, if well refined, can be quite valuable. Its potential effects are drain fatigue, poison, and water breathing. The mushroom, if quickly swallowed along with dirty ocean or pond water, can give a refill to your breathing meter. It can also be brewed into a much more potent water breathing potion if paired with Quamacuddle. Interestingly, the Luminous Russula is one of only two alchemical ingredients capable of creating a pure poison. The other, of course, being its close friend and counterpart, the Violet Copernus. Apart from pure poison, the Violet Copernus, hopefully after being washed, can be mixed with other reagents to produce potions of water walking. These are useful for long treks on which you wish to stay dry, or on escort missions. The Violet Copernus can also be used in Drain Fatigue poisons, amongst the base poison variety. The Black Lichen can be used to make poisons of Drain Speed or Drain Strength, rivaling the assholery of the Greater Bonewalkers. In terms of beneficial effects, Potion of Resist Frost can be created, protecting one from the harsh storms of Solstheim, or the fierce words of a Nord. Say something or move on. Cures to poison are also possible with this rare ingredient. With the green variety, you could make potions to fortify your personality or cure common disease, a must-have for the, uh, voyeurs of Vardenfell. Other effects include Drain Strength and Drain Health, so one should play it safe. Finally, we have the Red Lichen. When combined with other certain elements, it can create Drain Speed or Drain Magicka poisons. It can also be used to produce light, hinting at a possible bioluminescent gene.
It can be paired with green lichen to form Cure Common Disease potions, which calls to mind another certain set of perilous adventures. Now that we've learned of the biological properties of Vardenfell's fungi, let's talk about their other uses. Whereas the Nerevarine may be trying to discover a cure for blight akin to penicillin, other Vardenfell inhabitants use fungus in different ways. Vardenfell is a dangerous place. As such, the people of the land must defend themselves. Believe it or not, armor and weapons can be derived from the fungus that surround the island. Before I continue, it should be stated that most of the chitin used in these things is probably from the large insect species of the island. However, some parts probably need to be flexible in the case of armor. So let's just entertain the possibility that some comes from fungus, eh? We have to have a little fun, because I'm a fun guy. See? Do you think you could get out of this video without one of those? Fungi produce long chains of a polysaccharide within their cell walls, which aids in structure, which definitely would explain the ability of the Emperor Parasols to exist in the Escadian Isles. This is called chitin and also exists within certain bugs and other forms of life. Within Vardenfell, it is common to find lightweight and flexible chitin armor, along with weaponry such as bows and daggers. Not only does the fungus grow abundantly, but it is probably also cultivated by those that produce such armor and weaponry, aiding in its evolution by enhancing reproductive chance. Pretty smart. Beyond arms, we can also look to housing structures. Within the island exist a few great houses which control the many regions. One such house is called the Telvanni. These people grow their towers in the form of fungus, by way of magically enhanced spores. These towers often require levitation to traverse, and boast what I can only assume are monstrously large whips of hyphae which reach above ground. It is clear that fungi play just as much an important role in the island of Vardenfell as they do on Earth. Whether one is learning to breathe water, combat the wilds, or be a total nerd alone in a tower, fungi are there to lend a hand, or a hyphae. In real life, the importance of fungi is far overshadowed. An agricultural crisis has developed due to poor traditional methods of tilling and constant fertilizer use, which disallows natural fungi to prosper. Without specific fungal families, crops can fail and entire ecosystems could collapse. There is good news, however. Fungi can be used for many things, such as microremediation, where pollution is cleaned with the help of certain species. Food, packaging materials, furniture, housing structures, and more can all be created. On that note, I thank you for watching and sincerely hope that this has been a fun experience for you. As a bonus for making it this far, I'll share a few neat details with you, and some random extras. This fungus from ESO is a real thing called the red cage fungus. Also, fungi such as the emetic russula and stinkhorn from the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion are also real. And quick tip, emetic means it'll make you throw up. So uh, don't eat that. Here are two pictures of my cats, and maybe some videos in here, who knows. They helped me write the script and produce it, so you can th thank them as well. And here are some resources I use to produce the video's knowledge base. Thank you so much for watching, and have a good one.